Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming out to the uh, seminar series. Um, I won't uh, spend too long uh, speaking here because we want to hear what I, our speaker has to say. Uh, today we have with us Carrie Hand, who's uh, assistant professor uh, just down the road at the University of Western Ontario. And she's in the School of Occupational Therapy there and has interest in a lot of the things that we talk about, in, in, especially in our class on aging, in terms of social connectedness, inclusion, and participation among older adults. So I will turn the floor over to you. Welcome. Thank you. And, uh, uh, okay. Thank you for having me. This is great. a great opportunity for me to speak to a different audience that I don't normally get to speak to. I was just chatting with uh, Meredith earlier, the fact that she's the one that had suggested that I come, and so I thank her for that as well. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about um, engagement, social connectedness, inclusion in neighborhoods uh, for older adults. And just before we get started, I want to give you my perspective of uh, where I'm coming from with this talk. And I think this is probably familiar to a number of you, but drawing on some uh, scholars like Andrew Cresswell and Cutchin, I'm conceptualizing older adults as embedded in their neighborhoods. So seeing the neighborhood not as a static backdrop that they're in and actively engaged in, but seeing uh, lots of connections and complexity between the person and the place that they're living in. So it's really difficult to actually separate the person from the place that they're in. Um, there's all kinds of complex transactions and interactions happening, and that's really where my research is focused. I want to know what's happening at that level of interaction between the person and their environment, specifically seniors and their neighborhoods. So thinking about that perspective on people in places and aging in place uh, leads me a little bit to qualitative methods, or directly to qualitative methods, given that places that people are in are imbued with all kinds of meaning um, and people interpret the places that they're in differently. And so that kind of area needs qualitative methods to explore that can get at those interpretations. But there's some limitations to some of the qualitative methods, in particular interviews, for instance. Uh, they can't capture some of the not spoken things that people um, experience, the tacit information, the taken for granted aspects of life. You can't see a person interacting with their neighbors when you do an interview with them in their home. And so that makes me think about more geographically and spatially based methods, geospatial methods, and what I'm calling them are participatory geospatial methods. And by that, my team and I are meaning methods in which the person is involved in creating that spatial data. So maybe they're wearing a, G, a global positioning system GPS device and they're walking around or going around their communities. Um, it might mean a go-along interview where you're walking with that person in their environment and you're seeing how they're interacting. So I and my team are choosing to combine these methods and look at them in a, in a real um, intentional way, I guess, to kind of pick up how, what's happening um, when you're combining these methods. And it's for the reasons I just outlined, to get at the interpretations of place and to get at the person in their own context. So I looked at the aging literature to see how these methods have been used already. And they've been used in about three main ways. I identified about 11, 13, 14 studies that have used a combination of qualitative methods and participatory geospatial methods. And some of them use GPS tracking or activity diaries, and that's followed up typically by a map-based interview. So a map will be generated, similar to the ones that I brought here as examples, and they'll serve as a prompt for the interview and they'll talk about the person's day-to-day -day activities and try to get a sense of the person's lives in the neighborhoods. Other studies have used photo voice where you're taking photos, so getting the spatial data through that photo and then talking about the photos and talking about interpretations and meanings. And then finally, other studies use the go-along method that I mentioned, uh, where you're using the, the environment itself as an interview prompt and talking about all the different um, you know, interactions and objects and places and people that are present in that environment and how the person is transacting with each, with each one of those. Um, there's also these types of studies that have been done outside of the aging literature, but I was focusing um, more on aging. And this is actually in a paper that I just published in the Gerontologist, it's a scoping review. Anyway, generally looking across the methods, it seems that um, the spatial methods are given less importance than the qualitative methods. So, for example, it's often the case that the person might be track with a GPS device, a map is generated like these, and then the spatial data is left and the map just serves as an interview prompt. <coughs> Rather than going back and looking at those maps and seeing what comparisons between the maps can bring or what quantitative data might be able to pull out of that that might complement the qualitative data. 
it's also not completely clear what's happening when you're meshing these different types of data. So we've got, you know, maybe a go-along interview, a map, you've got a, um, a qualitative in-depth interview. How is that all coming together? And some of the authors have written about this a little bit, but not to the extent that I want to know about it and that, is, that I think is helpful in guiding others that want to implement these methods. So, that leads me to an ongoing study that I'm doing with some colleagues, uh, Debbie Rudman and Suzanne Hewitt in the School of Occupational Therapy at Western, and Jason Gilliland, who's in the Department of Geography at Western. And the purpose of the study has two main arms. The first is to find out about how person and place transact to shape social connectedness and inclusion in older adults. So that's the more substantive objective. And the methodological objective is to look at these methods and pick them apart and find out how do you combine these qualitative and spatial methods together? How can you analyze these data to bring about um, really you know, contextualized understandings about older adults um, aging in neighborhoods? So in our study, we're using uh, three main types. It's actually five types of data that we're collecting. The first, and this is in just a random order, uh, go along interviews where we're walking with the participants in their neighborhoods and talking with them at the same time. Narrative interviews and GPS tracking for four days, accompanied by um, activity and travel diaries that people fill out, followed by a map-based uh, map interview. So similar to some of the other methods that have been used, but not in this combination. <coughs> Right. Oh, one thing I did want to mention is just given that we're looking at the methods themselves, we varied the order of the data collection, so we didn't start with any particular um, type of data collection. Um, there are certainly repeats just because of the sample size, but we tried to change that up just to see what might be doing by the same. There's about, or there's definitely 14 participants in the study, and we, we drew them from two neighborhoods in London. Okay, so. Analysis, this describes what we're doing, but it's really, um, it's really a work in progress. So we started to analyze the data, and what we're doing so far is you know, immersing ourselves in the data, reading all the transcripts. Um, our research coordinator and I have read all the 42 transcripts and looked at the maps and looked at the activity diaries and just getting really familiar. And then we moved on to visualizing the maps. Um, so you know, displaying them all, having them in a big room, about 27 like this and trying to get, make sense of what's going on in those maps. Look at the spatial patterns, look at um, differences between the neighborhoods, et cetera. A lot of the techniques that we're using with the interview transcripts, all three interview transcripts, is narrative analysis techniques. So looking at ideas that are coming forward, um, key storylines that are present within the data, um, how the people are telling their stories, and then I'm creating core narratives. So the story of the people in their neighborhoods talking about their connections, their feelings of inclusion, um, how they're relating to that place of their neighborhood. And of course, looking at the data all in relation to one another, all different data types in relation to the other data types, and tons of reflexive note-taking. So reflexive note-taking regarding the knowledge that's coming out and the themes that are coming out, and then a parallel process of reflexive note-taking of the methods that we're using and how these are all getting together. Before I go any farther, has anybody used Spatial geographical methods, and have you combined them with qualitative? Ish. Ish. <laughs> yeah, I'm just wondering. Um, I'm always interested in hearing about people that are doing this kind of work to, try to you know, inform my own process. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about each data type. Um, and what we did specifically, and what's coming out of that. So in terms of the narrative interviews, we um, started with a, a general prompt, I'll read it to you. It was, I would like you to tell me what it is like for you to live in your neighborhood, now and in the past. This might include the places you go, the things you do, and the people you see. You can include anything that is important to you, and begin wherever you like. So that was the main prompt to get these narrative interviews started, and then there were additional questions incorporated to elicit further narrative within those interviews. Um, and then looking at the findings and the transcripts, it seems that um, there's all kinds of great information coming out, as you can imagine. And there's varying content and depth across the different participants, and all kinds of meaning is coming out. So I'll give you some examples. Um, 
some people talked about, uh, gave a detailed history of the area. So one participant is a former geographer and he knew all the history and all the geography of the area and took our interviewer to historically meaningful homes and showed where railways used to be and how the river used to flow, all kinds of meanings. And he was really connecting in a, in a kind of professional and personal way to his neighborhood. Um, another person had lived in the area for her whole life and her grandparents had lived in the area. And so she talked about this real feeling of continuity with the family connections and she has a large family. And just mentioning a, a real deep personal connection. I think this one said something like, it's home for her in a real uh, deep and meaningful way. Um, so a real deep sort of connection. Um, but other ones, a number of other ones, talk about the neighborhoods in a really practical way. So there's really good amenities for me. There's a bank around the corner, and the grocery store is here, and I can drive to the park or to my senior center, for instance. Um, some of them talked about how the neighborhoods mesh with their own identity and values. So a few participants talked about um, their value for healthy living, and their value for um, doing things that they think are going to keep them healthy, like exercising, eating right, and so on, and really presenting a picture of themselves as a, a successful ager and taking on some of the discourses around aging, um, and showing the interviewer that they are doing all the right things to be healthy. And really, there's a real mirror between their construction of themselves as a healthy and successful ager and how that matched with their neighborhoods that offers all these other opportunities for walking to their resources and buying healthy food and having parks in the area where they can exercise. Um, so yeah, just really interesting. Um, and so I think that the narrative that he was certainly are giving all kinds of meaning and all kinds of interpretations that are really relevant to the area today. In terms of the go-along interviews, this is they're really different. Um, it really illustrated some of the tasks that had not spoken things that people are aware of or maybe do in their day-to-day -day lives, but they don't say it in a sit-down interview in their home. So as I said, they went to a local, each participant went with the, with the researcher to a local destination, and along the way, they talked about where they were going, the route they were taking, why they were going there, and then using the neighborhood as a prompt. So the interviewer would ask them about different um, features of the neighborhood that they noticed. Uh, the participants often engaged in conversation or said hello to different people they saw, and so the interviewer had a chance to observe that. Um, so I, I'm trying to look at, pull out some of the key points to kind of illustrate the points that I'm trying to make and the value that these go-along interviews were bringing. Um, and it seemed that you could see some variation in how people were interacting socially with their neighborhoods. So one participant in particular is a real outlier, and she greeted everyone that they saw, and they went to a cafe and engaged in conversation with people at a couple different tables around her for about 10 minutes. And afterwards, the interviewer said, oh, were those some friends of yours? And she said, no, I've never met them before. They're just people that I talk with. And apparently, this is a pattern. Um, she just is a very friendly person, it seems, and really gets a lot of value out of being able to go out in her neighborhood and talk with people and not have to have planned something in advance. She's just able to make some social connections and feel included in her neighborhood in a real casual way. It's not, yeah, that's not planned in any way. They're not friends of hers, it's not her family, it's not her close social network, but it's still a valuable part of her experience. Um, other people greeted, you know, walkers, they greeted dogs. Um, here's some really, really funny and interesting things on tape about the people speaking to pets that they would see. Oh, weren't you a cute little guy? And just, you know, you can hear the enjoyment in their voice of being able to do these things. and. Um, getting reactions back from the people that they're encountering. Um, other people were less social, so they just wanted to get out and do their exercise, for instance. They wanted to go on a quick walk. They didn't want to engage and get slowed down. Um, so just a range, a range of how people are interacting. And just getting at the things that people aren't stating. So a number of people would have stated in the narrative interview that they do value walking in the neighborhood and they like to greet people. But it sounds kind of similar across participants when you look at the narrative interviews it's only when you get into the go-along so you can see how they're interacting in different ways. Um, you know, very social to not really social at all. The choice of the route is also an interesting thing. And I mentioned it within the narrative interviews, these kind of constructions of themselves as successful agers. And so that came through in a few of the neighborhood or a few of the go-along interviews where the participant took our interviewer on quite fast walks that I think that she had some trouble keeping up with. One used poles, like a pole walker to get more exercise, and they both did that. And 
just the, it was just a real embodied and, and enacted way of seeing um, how they enjoy their neighborhoods and the, the presentation of themselves that they're making um, as a healthy and active and able-bodied person. Uh, another person chose a route that he hadn't gone on in about 15 years, and it was quite difficult going up and down a ravine and navigating some kind of uneven terrain. And he just wanted to see if he could do it, uh, and he had the interviewer to go with him, and so he went ahead and did it. Um, so another uh, presentation that he's giving to the interviewer. Uh, other, inter other participants, like the geographer that I mentioned, gave the interviewer a real historical tour of the area. Um, and the participant that had a lot of family in the area gave her a real history, a personal history of her own family's life in that neighborhood. So a home that her grandfather had built, homes where her mother had lived, homes where her sister and her brothers and her had lived throughout their lives, where they currently live, where she lives. And so it's forming uh, what other authors have called a spatial biography of that person. Um, and I'm going to get into this a little bit later, but taking that information from the go-along could be placed onto a map like from the GPS tracking, and really get a, get a really nice understanding of that person's life in their neighborhoods. Okay. So then, uh, activity and location tracking. So as I mentioned, the participants wore a GPS device for four days, two weekend days, and two weekdays, and we tried to choose a reasonable amount of time. Uh, you know, maybe we would have liked it to have them wear it for a week, but we felt maybe that wouldn't be as successful if people forgot to wear it or maybe felt burdened by it. And at the same time, they wrote down all their activities on activity diaries, which actually was quite key, given that we had a, a little bit of technological difficulties with the GPS devices. So having those two sources of information was really, really quite crucial. Um, I'm going to go to the maps a little bit right now. So looking at the maps from this GPS tracking, we we're starting to do some comparisons between neighborhoods. and so. I don't know if you can see this with the right one um, But our two neighborhoods, A and B, A is a little bit more suburban, and B is a little bit more neighborhoody, kind of like Westdale, where there's a core area of services and houses around. And so, for instance, this is the more suburban area, and just looking at where people walk. So, it might be hard to see, you can come up later, but this participant did a walk in her neighborhood around here, and she ended up going on quite a busy road for a portion of it, up to her home and down again. Um, so a combination of residential streets and really busy streets, which I don't think, I'm not sure if that participant mentioned the fact that she was on that busy street in her interviews, which I'm fairly certain that she didn't. I can imagine that's not quite as pleasant on a walk for exercise as it would be on a residential street. Whereas this is a neighborhood with a more core area of um, amenities in the middle, and it's surrounded by more busy streets. And so here's a walk. The red is a walk in the neighborhood, and the person is all on residential streets, and doing this for exercise, and also hitting a couple of shops along the way. So there's some differences that can be seen just by looking at those maps. Um, other differences between the two types of neighborhoods were that people that live near the area that had the amenities all clustered together, most participants use those amenities, whereas in the neighborhood where things were more dispersed in the suburban area, um, it was really hit and miss as to who used what. They just used random sorts of resources within the neighborhood. Um, it's only a sample of 14 people, so it's not as if I'm drawing any sorts of generalizations, but it's a real nice starting point to think about the spatial data that we're getting and bringing that back to the qualitative data that we're getting and seeing what it actually means or what it might mean. So let's talk a little bit about bringing these types of data together. Bringing it together, so the point wasn't just to look at different types of data and look at them in isolation, the point is to bring them all together. And so the first thing that uh, we noted was the idea of how people conceptualize their neighborhood. So I think as we're talking about now, every person is, has a different concept of their neighborhood, what it means to them, and, and the, the area that the neighborhood is in. And specific to the, the area, in the narrative interviews, the people tended to talk about their neighborhood as the area around them. So their immediate you know, neighbors, a few streets, that's their neighborhood. In the, the GPS data, um, in the GPS interviews, where the people may have gone outside of their neighborhood for shopping or to visit friends and family, they talked about, not necessarily with any prompting, but talked about how this is my neighborhood also. I feel comfortable going to these places. I'm really 
go to my church often, and it's not actually in my immediate neighborhood, but I consider it all to be part of my neighborhood. So it got it, even within participants, different ways of understanding their own neighborhood, which I think it's bringing something new to the study, just because if we'd only used the one method, we might not have had a, as full an understanding. Um, given that the study was about connecting in neighborhoods and connecting with people in neighborhoods and connecting with places, um, the methods combined are giving lots of great information about that. And so, for one example, um, in, in the map-based interview for one of the participants, she talked a lot about how she goes to a senior center and she helps a lot of the, the seniors there with their computers, she gives them rides to different events, um, she gives another woman a ride to the church. So just all these sorts of helping sorts of activities, really talking about the day-to-day -day things that she does. And then in the narrative interview, she talked about um, attention that she's feeling in her helping role versus you know, taking care of herself. And so talking about people in her own apartment building that she had helped in the past, it just felt like she was overextending herself and they were asking her for too much. Uh, she gave the example of one woman asked her to come over to help her put her turkey in the oven because she was having family over. And she gets there and the woman still needed to prep the stuffing and put the stuffing in and wanted the, the participant to do all this for her, just feeling like that wasn't really what she was there for. Um, and so now she's negotiating the tension by uh, not reaching out as much to her immediate neighbors in her own apartment building and reaching out more to the people that are a little farther away where she can manage that relationship a little bit better. And so it's telling two sides of, or different sides of the same story, I guess. The GPS was more factual in terms of what she does and why she does it. She likes helping people and the narrative just cut into more of the nuances around what's actually going on within those relationships. Uh, another thing that came up was the idea that people are actively taking steps to shape their neighborhoods. And so we went in thinking about how each one is impacted the other, so thinking this might, this might be something that's happening. But the ways that they did it were a little bit unexpected, I think. Um, so in the narrative interview for one woman, she talked about cutting down the bushes in front of her porch so that she could see people. It felt, helped her to feel more connected. She cut down trees in her backyard um, as a way of feeling more safe. She felt like if the neighbors could see in and if she had had an injury or a health problem or an intruder had come in, then that was a way of her being safe. <coughs> so by doing those things, she's, she's doing it for herself, but she's also contributing to her neighborhood um, in terms of making it more social with her interactions with the porch, for instance. Lots of people were conscious about interacting with their neighbors in a way that created interactions and were being friendly. And they saw the neighborhood as friendly and they wanted to contribute to that as well. <coughs> me. Um, so that, I think that's interesting. And that came up uh, with the narrative interviews for sure, as well as in the goal on interviews where you could see people making these contributions to their neighborhoods. Okay. Um, the combinations of methods was really great for enabling agency in the participants. So the narrative interviews to begin with uh, asked the participants to share their story in a really unstructured way. So they're, they're taking control in that way. The go along interviews, similarly, the person chose the route and the destination, what they wanted to do. And then even with the map-based interviews, the people were talking about what they had done specifically, so what the track actually showed. They also spoke about other areas of their neighborhood that they wanted to bring up. So they weren't necessarily prompted to talk about those things, but seeing them on the map, they'd say, well, actually, sometimes I go to this senior center and not that senior center. So really um, getting them involved in the methods. I think the methods also um, encourage a lot of enthusiasm in the people. They were all, the ones that joined the study were all very um, excited to go with the interviewer on the three different, um, to do the three different types of interviews. A lot of it has to do with the fact that the research coordinator that did the interviews is just an amazing person. She's a woman doing her PhD and she's very friendly and sociable, so I think that went a long way. But they were excited to choose a route and go on this interview with the interviewer. They were excited to see the maps and see what they had done and realize how far they had gone that in those few days or what they hadn't done that they had thought they might have. And you can hear it in the interview recordings and see it in the transcripts. And so I think all of those things just generated um, a level of engagement among the participants to really help to co-construct those findings. So it's not just the person interviewing or me analyzing. It's a real um, negotiation between the two parties in creating this, these, uh, these findings. 
And we've talked about this a little already um, in terms of embodied and enacted transactions. So if, if I'm trying to look at how person and place are interacting and transacting, then the idea of having those things in front of us and embodied is uh, really key. So one participant talked about how she likes to walk in her neighborhood, but there's not enough sidewalks in her narrative interview. And then in the go-along, you can see what happened when the sidewalk ended and she had to go on the road and she talked about, well, if there's traffic coming, I'm on the street. If there's snow on the road, uh, I'm on the, on the curb. If there's snow on the road, I'm up on, on the grassy area. Um, so all those bits and pieces that you don't hear about um, in an in-home interview necessarily, just because people aren't really thinking about it, um, it's, it's tacit. And then in terms of the meanings of activities, so um, a number of participants talked about walking in their neighborhoods and some of them did it for fitness, some of them did it for social, some of them did it for a combination. Um, the GPS interview for one, so that would be in the narrative interviews, for one participant in the GPS interview she talked about meeting uh, a person that she hadn't known before, uh, asking her to go with her on her walk to the park, they did some hills in the park, they went back to a coffee shop and had some coffee. And so, um, Finding out about the, the value of her walking and that she walks a lot through an interview interview is great. This GPS tracking just brought a lot more detail to that as well, in terms of how that actually plays out in a person's day to day life. Okay. Um, in terms of time, so it's interesting to think about a person's life in the neighborhood over a period of time. And in the narrative interviews, the people often talk about years or decades of their lives um, in that neighborhood or in other neighborhoods. Whereas the GPS tracking is really focused on day to day, just a four day period. The go along even smaller because it was just focused on that actual time that the person were walking. Although certainly they're bringing in other parts of their lives. Um, the idea that this uh, living in a neighborhood and, and interacting and transacting with your environment is, is something that happens over time also came out of the interviews and the, the different types of data collection. So, one participant talked about how she, in her narrative interview, how she wanted to be more active. She was newly retired, and so she went to a senior center and has been doing activities there ever since. So that um, gave a certain amount of time. Within the GPS data collection, she talked about how um, at the senior center, the specific activities that she does, the relationships that she's made, the friendships that she's made that have extended outside of the so senior center, and you can see the process of her social engagement in the neighborhood happening over a number of years um, through the different types of data collection. Okay. And then sequence. So I mentioned how we vary the sequence of the different, the different types of data collection. So in general, the interviews built upon one another. We expected this to happen. You know, getting to know the interviewer, you're relying on things that you told her already, and referring back to things that you discussed before, so there was some build across the interviews regardless of the methods. Um, in terms of the depth of the information that the people shared and the levels of interpretation that they're putting on it and the reflection that they're doing, it did seem that the narrative interviews generated the most reflective sorts of conversations among the participants. Um, they were certainly reflective go-along interviews and reflective GPS-based interviews though. One thing that we did notice though is that across participants there were probably more very, there was more variation than across types of data collection. So the really reflective participants tended to be that way in all types of data collection. Um, and the ones that weren't, weren't. And then feasibility. So generally, uh, the methods worked well. So the people knew how to use their GPS devices, they completed their activity diaries, they engaged in the interviews, um, things like that went well. We needed to have a little bit of flexibility with the go-along interviews in terms of when it rained or if it was too hot, uh, travel schedules. Um, one person had a knee replacement shortly before the study started, so he didn't want to do his go-along until about eight weeks later. So, you know, just a little bit of flexibility was needed around those sorts of things. I mentioned the technology. The GPS devices didn't collect data for chunks at a time. So in the for the first few participants, there were a couple that maybe missed a four-hour period, say, or the person maybe forgot to turn it on for one day. We had a, a procedure in place where a research assistant checked in every other day with the person just to see how things were going. And he was able to change out any, uh, and with instructions to call him if anything was wrong. So that did happen when there was, um, you know, it didn't seem like that it was being collected, the machine was beeping. So he was able to switch it out. And we really don't know what was going on, but 
cardiographer is assuring me that as you get better and better GPS devices, this is less likely to happen. Um, it's hard not knowing all the technology myself, but I think he has a good handle on it. Uh, the study generated a lot of data, so only 14 participants, but we have 42 transcripts and 27 maps, 14 activity diaries, and tons and tons of reflexive notes about everything. So managing all of this data is what I'm in right now, and I've been doing it since last fall, and I'm continuing now. Um, it's it's a, it's something that needs some management strategy. So I've been doing things like chunking the, you know, putting the activity diaries into really brief. Um, Paragraphs so that I can link it more easily to other data. I'm trying to chunk out different themes. Um, trying to look at data together. So displaying all the maps at once and trying to hold that information in my mind as I'm also thinking about the themes and how those themes are linking to the specific places on the maps. Um, this is what I like to talk to lots of people that are doing this sort of work. And it's, it's good when I do that. Um, but at the same time, I feel like every type of data collection that we did is bringing something unique and something valuable to the study. And so thinking about moving forward, I don't really know what to cut out because I value everything that each part has brought. Um, so that's just something that I'm thinking about right now. But I think, um, I think these, these methods are showing value. I think that there's value in the combinations that we've made. And I think it's a good idea to continue to use them and to try to refine them a little bit more, which is what I'm going to take up right now. I can see implementing these methods within a, a methodology. So this is more of a methodological study, just looking at those specific methods. But in a larger study, I might want to choose something like ethnography, for instance, that could bring all the methods together and hold them together. A grant of theory might apply, critical approaches. You know, I think there's a number of different ways this could go. Um, but in general, I think that it's generating some real great contextualized information that's lacking right now in the Asian literature. Um, it's just pulling out things that, that probably has been talked about before, but maybe not in this way. And I think that that's uh, going to add real value. Thank you. Thank you.